Hi, this is Scott Garibay, and today we're going to talk about Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition. And today, I'm going to give a prediction. I'm going to predict what products I expect to see from Dungeons & Dragons, from Wizards of the Coast, for the Dungeons & Dragons line, in 2022 or in 2023. Um, I'm going to drop them right now. Alright, here we go. Alright, let's talk about it. Uh, so, here's my prediction. I'm predicting we're going to get... A Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition Oriental Adventures with a corrected name. Okay? Alright, so let's talk about uh, um, Oriental Adventures. So, um, Oriental, Oriental Adventures is one of... It's it's a Gary Gygax book. Um, I actually own it. It's um, It came out in uh, for Dungeons & Dragons 1E, 1st Edition, right? And it, it specifically is... Um, so basically, Dungeons and Dragons Oriental Adventures is specifically a um, a very clear um, Gary Gygax product that came out from TSR. I believe the year was 1985, and it's an orange spine easily. And so basically, it has the orange classic classic. It's I own all 12 of the orange spine easilies. It cost I got them literally this year in 2021. It cost me $600 to get all 12 of them. Uh, it took about four months to do it, and Oriental Adventures is one of those orange spine easilies. They all have an orange spine. They're all D and D one E, um, and um, they and they all have a Jeff Easley cover, right? And Oriental Adventures is one of them. All right, so let's talk about that. So, Gary Gygax product, orange spine, uh, classic hardback, right? Um, and then it's in Dungeons and Dragons first, Dungeons and Dragons 1E, when you talk about 1E, 2E, 3E, 4E. Uh, D&D 1E is 74 to 89. Uh, D&D 2E is 89 to 99. D&D 3E is 1999 to 2008. Uh, D&D 4E is 2008 to 2014. Uh, D&D 5e is 2014 to uh, to today. Now, I know when you get into D&D 1e, there's a bunch of people who are like, oh, it's Moldvay, it's Holmes, it's Advanced, it's, you know, um, it's, you know, original box, you know, they, it gets split in Beckme, it gets split into 100 different, to me, it's done D&D 1e, all right? All right, so, so yet, so it's a D&D 1e book. All right, so let's talk about it. So first of all, what was it and what was it not, Okay. Um, what it was, was it was a Gary Gygax product. What it was, was it was a complete TSR and Gary Gygax together standing, just, you know, applauding and praising and being a complete fanboys of Japan. Right? It's a Japanese, uh, it, it, it's, it's a Japanese fanboy, uh, not in a bad way, like genuine fans, like love Japanese, called, like, uh, I think Gary Gygax and TSR just absolutely loved um, Japanese culture. And so basically, Oriental 19, uh, the 1980s Orient Adventure Orange Spine Easily book is saying, hey, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, all the rules are the same, but you can play a samurai, and you can play a ninja, and you can play, you know, and you're going to fight Japanese Oni, and you're going to have a cool, super cool horse, you're going to have all the, you know, the samurai armor, you're going to have katanas and wakazashis, and the whole nine, right? Like it's just, hey, D here's D and D with with mixed with Japanese f J Japanese feudalism, right? Japanese feudalism, right? Uh, Tokugawa era, all of it, right? Now, what it also was was a very inappropriate name. I, I think Oriental Adventures was inappropriate, and I think um, I think Dungeons and Dragons could have had a better name for that, right? What they what they should have done is what they did in third edition, okay? So, when it comes to 3rd edition, there was a second go at an Oriental Adventure books. And it actually says Oriental Adventures in small type on it, in the corner, on the cover. But at the top, it says Rokugan. Okay? And Roku and this is a much better title, right? Like, and I think they should have just left the Oriental Adventures off, off and said Rokugan, right? And so, this is a fantasy world that is Japan, that, give, that allows Japanese culture to be in Dungeons & Dragons... But it's not saying, hey, this is Japan. It's saying, hey, this is Rokugan. Yay, right? You know, and that, that's a pretty cool, that's a cool approach, right? But the reality is, you know, uh, you it takes a lot of risk when you're like, hey, we're going to base this off of a particular time and people, 
and we're going to fantasize, you know, we're putting a fantasy label on it, right? And I don't think the execution on the first one was perfect. I think they should have been, it should have been, it should have been named had, just like Rukugan, should have had a fantasy name for a specific realm, and then they they could never even mention Japan. They could just be like, you know, they could they could put samurai in the game and just make it look like feudal Japan, but say this is a fantasy version, and also put in some distinctors that made it really unique and of its own, right? So here's so basically, I think here's what's going to happen now. So right now. I want you to be aware, aware of a 2021 trend. So basically, there are we just got Strixhaven. Strixhaven is the third time that Wizards of the Coast on Fifth Edition has gone to a Magic Gathering source, uh, Magic Gathering setting. First was Ravnica, then was Theros. Okay, we just got Strixhaven, right? And actually, I think this is working. I think these books are selling well, and um, and I think. Dungeons and Dragons is very happy with these with these mixed books, and I'll tell you right now, these mixed books, they have some very distinct advantages. So one of the things is they make the art way better for the Dungeons and Dragons products, right? Um, they they really do. So like they their synergy, like that's a word, and like everybody's like, oh synergy, I don't like it, right? But like if you think about, we're talking this is D and D meta. I talk about D and D meta, right? I talk about the industry. I talk about the designers. I talk about you know things beyond the subclasses, things beyond, you know, how to make the best build, right? Like, you know, and, and actually I'm trying to be more open and say that that is not devalued content. It's not the content I want to, I want to focus on, right? Because one, it's being covered, right? You guys don't need me to like tell you what the best subclasses is because it's already being done by 10 channels, right? You know, so, so here we, so basically this D and D, um, I think we're we're about to get a new Dungeons and Dragons setting. What is that? Well, it's going to be the fourth. This is my prediction, and it'll come in 2022 or 2023. And I actually have two predictions. So here's the first: we're going to get a new, better titled Oriental Adventures. Right? Oriental Adventures, I think, was an inappropriate name. Shouldn't have been used. Um, you know, Gary Gygax did not execute perfectly on creating Dungeons and Dragons. He made some mistakes, right? This is one of the mistakes, right? And it was slightly corrected when 3rd Edition brought out Rokugan, right? Which was the lore, Legends of the Five Rings setting, right? That beca- that Dungeons and Dragons literally, you know, bought the rights to make the setting in Dungeons and Dragons and was like Oriental Adventures. And they put Oriental Adventures in a little, you know, slot on the corner. I own the book, right? I own, I own, the, I own the Orange Spine Easily copy and I own the... Uh, um, the third edition copy, right? So here's, uh, I have to say this though, I've never run either one, right? And one of the reasons why is I, I'm not completely sure how to, how to address, uh, you know, cultural appropriation, which I think there's a little bit of in those books. I don't think it came from a bad place. Like I think Gary Gygax and TSR absolutely loved, um, you know, and in third edition, I think Wizards of the Coast were very, very, you know, enamored with, um, with Japanese culture, it, w- it wasn't coming from a mean place. It just wasn't executed well, right? So here's what's ha- here's what, so. But I will tell you right now. I think there's a lot of people who really want to see an Oriental Adventures type setting return, right? And I think we're going to get it. And here's my prediction, right? So in 2004, Magic the Gathering cr- uh, created two, three sets, right? Started in 2004, extended into 2005. They created Champions of Kamigawa. They created betrayers of Kamigawa and they created saviors of Kamigawa three different sets okay and these were um, a Japanese themed Magic the Gathering set okay there were there were rat ninjas in it there were samurais all over it there were monks in it like you know and by the way monk is a major you know it's a major theme and samurai that class literally exists in um in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. I think it came in the Volos guide, right? And so um, so it's there, right? Samurai may be in Xanathar's. You know what? I'm sorry. It's in Xanathar's. So Samurai, to my knowledge, is in Xanathar. Um, and so you can play a Samurai in, in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition right now, right? But that's not a full uh, Japanese-themed setting, right? So I think what's going to happen is we're going to get Kamigawa, right? Now, just here, where I just told you about the 2004 and 2005 sets. What's happening right now in Magic the Gathering? 
Well, they're advertising, and you can watch a really cool trailer for Kamigawa Neon Destiny. And this is really, really unique, right? So, um, so Magic the Gathering is a fantasy setting, right? But the Kamigawa setting, the Kamigawa Neon Dynasty setting, is a cyberpunk Japanese Tokyo setting, right? Very cool, very unique, very different right? And it has that Oriental Adventures flavor. We need to fix the title, right? But like, reason why I keep saying Oriental Adventure, I'm not trying to be insensitive. I'm just trying to connect that there's a history of this in Dungeons and Dragons. And for both versions, that history been, has been attached to the inappropriate name Oriental Adventures, right? So what I think we're going to get now is we're going to get as the fourth Magic Gathering setting to be officially converted into Dungeons and Dragons. I think we'll get the Kamigawa, the Kamigawa setting, okay? Um, and the traditional 2004 setting, okay? The um, Champions of Kamigawa, Betrayers of Kamigawa, Saviors of Kamigawa, and the old fe Japanese feudalism, like the Tokugawa era of like the 14th and 15th century, okay? Not the, I don't think we're going to get the, um, the Kamigawa Neon Destinies as a setting. I think what we're going to get is we're going to get um, Kamigawa as as a new setting. I don't think Oriental Adventures will be anywhere near it, right? Like the, the title will be gone and it'll just say Kamigawa. Now, why would they do this? Well, first of all, there is a strong history of Japanese theme books in Dungeons and Dragons. It was right there in 1E. It's right there in 3E, right? And these are well-beloved books because... Uh, I mean, how many people really like Dungeons and Dragons who aren't like samurais are super dope, right? They they are. They're like, you know, super cool armor, super cool horses, uh, super cool sword, wakazashis and katanas. Everybody, like the Venn diagram over who loves Dungeons and Dragons and who loves uh, feudal Japanese history is like, you know, it's almost a complete overlap. Right? Come on, like who doesn't love samurais, right? Like they're one of the coolest. They're like a knight, but with a cooler history, right? So, so I think there's a, there's a definite market for this, right? And there's a tradition for it. And one of the things I think is really happening right now is Dungeons and Dragons, is Wizards of the Coast are like, we really need to embrace our history. No two ways about it. We, we cannot walk away from our history. And here's a good and perfect example, okay? They just announced a new collector's box set for Ghostbusters, right? What's in it? Ghostbusters 1, Ghostbusters 2, and Ghostbusters Afterlife, right? They tried to do a reboot and forget the history of um, of Ghostbusters in 2016. Hard reject from fans and you know, from fans, right? So Dungeons & Dragons is like, we got to keep this in favor. We got to make recognizable characters. We got no time to be farting around and like turning the whole world upside down, right? And so that's, that's I think, one of the reasons why you will see a Kamigawa setting. So I think Kamigawa is coming to Dungeons and Dragons. One more prediction. Magic the Gathering is pushing Kamigawa into the future, right? Even though Magic the Gathering is a fantasy setting. Second, uh, so second prediction. Within 2021, 22, or 2023, I think we will look, we will see again, we will see again a second, um, uh, we will see a new D20 modern D10, D20 future, right? I own those two books. They're both third edition books. They are spectacular, right? I just I just bought them at Second Charles. I got really good deals on them. They weren't expensive at all. Um, and like, they're like 20 bucks a piece. I was amazed. I got, and they're beautiful, gorgeous. Uh, you should, guys should snap those up if you get a chance. They're really, really good. And they're not expensive right now. You can get them at Noble Knight Games. Um, and so, you know, so this is, I think this is a really cool, um, you know, I, th so here's what I think because they're pushing Kamigawa to the future. I think we're going to see a return of a detour. We're going to see a Dungeons and Dragons modern a Dungeons and Dragons future, right? Uh, actually, let me just, let me just leave it at Dungeons and Dragons modern. They're not going to go to future right away. I think they'll go to D and D modern. And I think there would be a huge demand for a Dungeons and Dragons modern game. And so basically they'll say, Hey, uh, we're going to give you the real stats for assault rifles and for, you know, um, pistols and submachine guns and everything and rocket launchers and the whole nine. Um, and we're also going to, you know, give you mechanics for how to shoot, you know, a rocket launcher from the side hanging while you're hanging out the window of a car, right? Like, 
that I think the community would go bonkers for that. Like they they would just like because we already have the you know this is already being done. Every everybody's eating their lunch, right? They're um they're saying hey we um you know there's lots of like uh, there's a spy game that does it already that used the old 3.5 OGL to let people play in modern games, and so I think there'd be a really high demand for this. And here, so how are they going to get away with this, right? So one, how are they going to bring an Oriental Adventure style world, right? Well, first of all, when they bring Kamigawa, who can complain, right? And uh, you know, because Kamigawa has been an MTG setting for since 2004, for for like 17 years, right? So Kamigawa has been a Japanese themed feudal setting for 17 years and it really has not been any complaint, right? So the lessons that need to be learned to make it, hey, Japanese themed, but not, you know, offensive, they've already been worked out in MTG. So I think that's how they're, and I think there's going to be, and I really think there'll be a strong demand for D&D Modern. All that's my opinion. What do you think of these predictions? Do you think these will happen? I'd love to hear your thoughts. Let me know in the comments below. Please consider liking, subscribing, and have a wonderful millennium.